cladistic method so we will introduce uh, the method called maximum parsimony in this uh, lecture so what is a cladistic we already introduced the concept is called the cladistic it's it can be contrasted with the distance based approaches in the systematics uh, or the phylogeny reconstruction methods so cladistic or discrete or optimality methods we are looking at individual variation you know we are not looking at the distance matrix there is no distance matrix here and also we are generating multiple trees millions rather billions of trees right if you have a large data set and out of which we are choosing just one best uh, you know uh, the tree that is which is nothing but a model isn't it so for character data about the physical traits of organism like morphology of the organs and for deeper levels of taxonomy the cladistic approach is almost always superior comparing with the distance method and these are based on the assumption that a set of sequence evolved from a common ancestor by a process of mutation and selection without mixing hybridize other horizontal gene transfer there is no hybridizer or intermixing happening but the process of evolution is happening here uh, you know mutation selection and drift so that is what the cladistic method is mostly uh, you know extension of the darwin's theory of the evolution you know so the main difference i already told you that input for the data analysis is not a distance matter there is no such intermediate in any of the steps of the cladistic methods and discrete methods consider each site directly and generate a number of trees based on each site and discrete methods allow us to infer the attributes of the extinct ancestors like you know you have no proof of this uh, uh, the interior node so usually interior nodes are hypothetical uh, you know extinct uh, species isn't it so you can even say that okay this extinct species which is non-existent today uh, you know has got the gene sequence like this you know see that's very interesting isn't it what would have been the gene sequence of a tiktaalik for example uh, the the transition fossil between uh, you know the fish and vertebrate in the land land colonization isn't it so tiktaalik carboxylase uh, you know enzyme what would have been sequence we can do it same methods we can use it in linguistics to i have been working in linguistics you know like for example proto dravidian language so what would be uh, the word for salt you know salt in proto dravidian you can do that by doing this cladistic approach fantastic isn't it very interesting so one example here the same uh, the, the data set drosophila fugu mouse and human we have already calculated the distance to make this distance uh, based method now coming to the parsimony which is basically character based there is no distance here so here you can see the tick mark represent the difference exact difference between uh, you know uh, for example the drosophila is differing from all the rest from by one and two positions that is what this tree I can easily infer so let us go and check it out drosophila is differing from all the rest from by one and two position that's right one and two all the rest is a a a a but drosophila is getting t see that is what this number one and two means fugu is differing from the rest by number three let us uh, consider so number three position yes it's a t while all the rest have got an a you know so that is what this number means so the parsimony right so parsimony is one of the very popular method for reconstructing the ancestral relationship so parsimony allows uh, the use of all non evolutionary information at each site in building a tree so you are looking each site separately so you know in contrast the distance method they actually put every single thing into one number the distance number them in the matrix you know and then you are considering the tree based on that number alone right that is highly inaccurate isn't it so how do you build the trees with this parsimony so parsimony approach is again a direct extension of uh, occam's razor concept you know so being parsimonious means you have to reduce the number of steps taken you know fewest evolutionary changes so it's the same thing like minimum evolution the concept the philosophical undercurrent remains same parsimony involves evaluating all possible trees and giving each a score based on only one criteria number of evolutionary changes that are needed to explain the observed data and the best tree is the one that requires the fewest base changes for all sequences to derive from a common ancestor so that is how 
the tree is being built in the parsimony. So parsimonious, the word meaning, if you search in the dictionary, word web, you know, I, I love word web, right? So if you look in the word web or any, or any of this uh, dictionary, you will see that very unwilling to spend money or use resources, you know, like miserly, isn't it? Niggardly or, you know, all those uh, things. Frugal is better option, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so that means that you are actually, you, you don't want to spend money. So same way, the parsimonious tree, you're minimizing number of steps which is needed. If I just ask you, I'm presenting two trees, which one is most parsimonious? As you know, the, the trees are nothing but hypothesis or model. So which model will you choose? The one which need least changes. So this tick mark you can count one, two, three, four, five, six here. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it needs one additional stop. You can see that this is additional stop because bony skeleton of all these fish and relatives, the vertebrates, has been independently evolved in the ray fin fish and the ancestor of all those, uh, you know, uh, the land uh, vertebrates. So this is an additional stop, which is not good in parsimony, right? So according to the principle of parsimony, we will go with this tree because it needs the least number of steps. So similarly, if you look only the position number two, that is A, G, G, A, you know, and then you, you, you can construct just by looking at the position number two, you can construct three trees. So each, uh, you know, a little bit different from the rest. So according to this tree, so you're seeing G in the human being, you know, like here, G is the second position G, right? It had been originally an A, that A changed into the G and the A remained same in the Drosophila. Drosophila it is basically A, isn't it? And now in the case of Fugu and uh, mouse, right now it is mouse is G, Fugu is A. So ancestry it had been an A that remained same for Fugu, but it changed into the G. So A to G, of course there is a substitution, you know? All these are models of substitution. Now you see that the utility of this model. So all these things you are modeling by probabilistic equations, you know. So A to G and A to G, there are, the, you need to have two changes, two steps for this tree. Now for tree number two, how many changes do you need? You need again two changes. Here A to G and here A to G and vice versa. So you need again two changes for tree number two. Coming to tree number three, how many changes do you need? Just one, A to G, you know? So the least number of changes is tree number three. So this is the most parsimonious and we will go with this tree according to the position number two. I hope it's clear. Now, similarly, you have to construct for every position and then you have to check the most optimal tree you have to uh, choose it. Right? So, do you have to draw the tree for every position? No. Only those positions with the dot here. Because this, posi this position number 3 or number 1 is of no use. Because no, uh, these are invariable, right? Every single thing has got a G. So, no point. It's, you know, the tree makes no sense. Position number 2 is also not good. Position number, uh, I mean, position number 2 is good. It's parsimony informative. That is uh, the, the, the term. And our position number... Three invariable, no point. Position number four is also useless because only one is varying, rest is all same. These are called simple single turn sites. And position number five is again is good, it's informative. So all these dot is basically parsimony informative sites. So number five we can construct a tree, and number six we can construct, number eight and nine we can construct. So likewise, you are constructing multiple trees. Uh, sometimes millions of trees and then you are choosing the best tree so i already inform uh, i mean i already introduced this concept of parsimony informative that means uh, not all sites contribute a uh, useful information to the counting of the mutation to construct the the tree the parsimony tree maximum parsimony tree so invariant site where every single thing has got same base of it's worthless so a single turn only one sequence is varying from the rest you know, so uh, parsimony informative sites are if and only if it has got two different characters that are represented by at least two different sequences. Two, two, at least. 
then that is called parsimony informative sites that you can use it the problem with the parsimony the main problem is as identified by felsenstein is something called long branch attraction so if a parsimony is good if it's almost every single thing is i mean all these species are highly related but if uh, two are highly unrelated what is going to happen is that two rapidly evolving unrelated lineages tend to cluster together they tend to group together that is long branch attraction <laughs> one simple example is i can tell you that well i i was in japan uh, you know i was a foreign student in the japanese land right i was a government scholar so i was uh, awarded the, the munbusho scholarship next very prestigious and when I, when i was there one of my good friend was a sweden uh, he he comes from sweden in the scandinavia and we two are the only you know foreign student uh, the rest of uh, the students in the lab were all uh, japanese so naturally you know we both are have this long branch you know very different from the rest of the group so then we got attracted and we st start to talk a lot and we became good friends you know so then that is what and in the class also you might uh, note like you know so if everybody else is speaking one language but two guys or two girls or two guy and a girl speaks two different language which is not really same as the the in group then naturally they they might become more close isn't it so long branch get attracted isn't it that is the problem with this parsimony tree because that attraction is not natural just because the two are very different from the rest doesn't mean that they both are very similar you know so once you do this analysis uh, whatever the tree that you are getting it's not reliable if uh, two taxa are really distant and uh, uh, you know spuriously they looks together you know uh yeah that is called long branch attraction so you know so that that becomes a problem so the, uh the problem there is a zone and at which this becomes a lot more prominent that is called felsenstein zone named after joe felsenstein uh yeah so in the felsenstein zone no matter how much data that we have parsimony will converge onto the wrong tree so this is illustrated in this particular problem here so you can see that two and three are really long the branches are really long right so that is now going to cluster together two and three together and the rest so if presented with this taxa it doesn't mean that two and three are really close it it just clustered together because of the faulty algorithm that we are using you know so another issue here you can see that archaea and microsporidia both have got very long branch and because of the long branch attraction the uh, you know the the parsimony tree final tree you are going to get uh, you know uh, uh, the tree like this archaea microsporidia like that so that is actually incorrect or look at here uh, paralogous gene and bacteria so bac paralogous gene becomes the root then comes bacteria because of that reaction you know so that is a problem biggest problem with the with the parsimony so it looks at individual sites where there are differences between the bases so it completely ignores the possibility of multiple mutations that cancel out each other you know so that is another of the non issue with this uh, uh, maximum parsimony so the the mutation that cancel out each other is completely ignored you know so it just look at the differences and usually performs well with closely related sequences but often performs badly with very distantly related sequences because of the same problem of the long branch attraction that is the biggest limitation of this parsimony based phylogenetic reconstruction and with distantly related sequence the homoplasy becomes another major problem you know the homoplasy means uh, uh, you know or, or parallel evolution right the convergent evolution that results in the homoplasy right so uh, look similar the, the sequence looks similar but actually there doesn't have any a uh, common ancestor you know so classic example is uh, uh, you know the uh, wings of the bats which is actually a mammal and wings of the bird you know avian which is kind of a reptile and wings of mosquito which is uh, you know it's a, just an appendage right it's an insect so the functionally everything the wing is for locomotion to fly but structurally and deep in homology if you look there is no commonality it doesn't have any common ancestor not shared between 
uh, you know with any other species so that is called convergent evolution so that homoplasy is yet another problem if you look at the distantly related sequences and maximum parsimony is based on the implicit assumption that evolutionary change is rare but evolution is not parsimonious so that assumption the basic assumption itself is wrong so mp is not that useful you know again that is not really preferred uh, by the current day uh, molecular phylogeneticists uh, rather we go with the um, maximum likelihood or maximum uh, i mean basic inference which are more accurate measurements you know so this is uh, i hope you already know about homologous and analogous sequences the homologous can be homologous means it's because of the divergent evolution but analogous because of the convergent evolution that is what the homoplasy is so this homoplasy is a major problem with the uh, parsim maximum parsimony method especially if you are using uh, if you are including uh, distantly related uh, sequences that is the often the case if you're looking at a higher taxonomic levels you know uh, homologous sequence is not a problem right orthologous and paralogous by the way orthologous are the sequences separated by uh, you know uh, speciation events while paralogous are the homologous sequences separated by gene duplication events so that's it so in summary the maximum parsimony is uh, uh, it used to be one of the very common approaches in maximum uh, in in the in the phylogenetic inference and it's still used at the family level uh, you know or the species level uh, where every uh, you know all these in groups are kind of similar you know it doesn't have anything which is really apart from the rest but you will never know it right how big is the difference right so closely related maximum parsimony is still acceptable uh, and it's still much much better than distance based method like ubgma or uh, neighbor joining which we discussed in last module but still inferior if you compare that with maximum likelihood or bayesian inference and another main difference is that maximum parsimony is a non parametric method while the other one is a parametric method you know if you remember in statistics these two terms means non parametric is rank based and it doesn't actually infer much about it doesn't actually assume anything about uh, the probability distribution you know it's distribution independent while parametric method is distribution dependent so the advantage of going with parametric is that it tends to be uh, you know it tends to uh, have uh, you know better inferences you know more rigorous statistical inferences at the same time robustness is better for non parametric like this maximum parsimony is non parametric you know so everything has got its own advantage and disadvantage and basically pa maximum parsimony or maximum likelihood the question is deep inside the philosophy isn't it maximum parsimony is based on occam's razor principle while maximum likelihood is more uh, rigorous frequentist statistical approach which doesn't actually assume anything on occam's razor you know so ultimately it's about uh, uh, it's about uh, you know how accurate your assumptions are and how accurate the tree needs to be right so for uh, the statistical rigor concerned maximum likelihood and bayesian inference is a lot more preferable that we will see it in our next module